chapter 1. <clears throat> share with you a quote. Religion preserves our pride, whereas relationship requires us to cast pride aside. Let me say that again because it's, it's a hard thing to, to grasp just reading it once. I had to read it several times. Religion preserves our pride, whereas relationship requires that we cast aside our pride. Religion is our efforts, our works, our hope that we are good enough for God. That's pride. Relationship says, I'm not able to do it. I can't do it. I don't have the ability to do it. But I can love you the best that I can. And that's casting off pride. God wants that relationship more than he wants our works or our pride or our abilities. Because he's looking for a personal relationship. Concerning pride, there was a minister who told his congregation, next week I plan on preaching about the sin of lying. And so to help you understand, he said, I want you to go home and read Mark chapter 17. The following Sunday, as he prepared to deliver his sermon, the minister asked for a show of hands. How many of you read Mark chapter 17? And the whole church raised up their hands. And the minister said, interesting, because there is no Mark chapter 17 in the Bible. And so he went on to give his sermon on the sin of lying. <clears throat> think about that for a second. I thought to myself, well, what does that have to do with pride? But think about it. How many times does our pride cause us to lie because we don't want to look like a fool? <clears throat> How many times do we pretend to be good or righteous because of pride and not necessarily because of relationship? See, relationship is able to be honest with one another and say, hey, I've got faults. And no, I didn't do it. I apologize. But it doesn't jeopardize our relationship, does it? Pride does. Because now you're labeled as a liar. And now who can you trust when you lie? So we're going to talk about this relationship this morning in depth. Last week we looked at chapter 1, verse 13 through 16. We ended with Peter encouraging us with some instruction on be holy for God is holy. As he said it emphatically, I am holy. And so you be holy. And we saw that this holiness is not a religious act. It's not a, a set of ten commandments. We can't pull out a little pamphlet with a list of things that we have to do. Okay, I'm holy. I've met them all. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a relationship here. He's talking about a holiness that says, I'm separating myself for God. I'm separating myself away from sin and this world, and I am separating myself unto the Lord. It's kind of like a relationship in, in your marriage when you meet somebody. When you first meet somebody, you know, that, that first time, that first moment that all of a sudden you realize, I love that person. There's a connection. I don't know what it is. I can't explain it, but it's like something just happened. Fireworks, a display. And now you separate yourself from your friends, from your family, from your old life. And you say, I want to be with this person. You're holy. You're separating yourself under that person. That's what holiness is all about. And so Peter takes that thought and he begins again to explain to us this precious cost of redemption through Jesus Christ, who not out of works, not of, of law, but out of love came to this earth to die for us. And so let's read verses 17 through 21. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, 
as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundations of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you, who through him believed in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Peter continues on with the little conjunction word and in the New King James. It's K-A-I in the Greek, K. What it's doing, it's connecting the last verse and statements with the next statements. And it's saying that this holiness is connected with this call on the Father. As he says, if you call on the Father. Uh, the Greek word for if is not if, but it's since you call on the Father. Remember, these are saints who are suffering, who are going through persecution. And yes, they're calling on their Father in heaven. And it's speaking here of a relationship. And Peter mentions that you have a relationship with your Father in heaven. And since you are to be holy and separated from whatever you're going through unto the Lord, and you call on God... And so he's taking that point of holiness and separation and saying now you have to deepen that relationship with your father in heaven, that intimacy. People can have close relationships with a range of people, can't we? Who they claim to be friends, relatives, co-workers, parents, children, you know, any person you can have some sort of intimacy with them. Uh, all depends on how close they are. All depends on how much intimacy you want to have. All depends on how much intimacy they want to have. Whether they just want to be acquaintances or whether they want more than that. But we have relationships. We have a relationship here. Uh, all of you have a relationship with me. It differs. Some of you will shake a hand. How are you? And then you take off. It's not a deep relationship, but it's an acquaintance. It's It's a brother in Christ. I know that, but it's not very... It's not very deep. Others are more than that. How are you doing, Pastor? Or how are you doing? And how's life? And it's a little deeper, you know. But yet, oh, okay, we're fine. That's good. See you later, you know, type of thing. And others are, no, really, how are you doing? Really, can I pray for you? You know, can we go to God? Can I, can I lay my hand on you and you get a little more intimate, right? We all have those types of relationships. They say there are three dimensions to relationships. There's the cognitive, the emotional, and the behavioral. Cognitive. That's the mind. The one that thinks about the person all the time. You know, it's cognitive. You're always thinking about them. And of course, again, it depends on that relationship. You know, some of you, I have, have that relationship where it's just shaking the hands. But you know, every once in a while I think about you. And I pray to the Lord, Lord, I don't know what's keeping them from here. Whatever that is, you know, you know what it is. And so you draw them if this is where you want them. I think about you every once in a while. And we have that cognitive relationship, you know. Then there's that deeper one, you know, that, that woman or that man you meet. And you're like, oh, I'm in love. And so you go home and you just can't get them off of your mind. You're constantly thinking about them. So much so you forget to eat, you know. And so you're like, when was the last time you eat? I don't remember, you know. Well, you're looking skinny. Are you in love? You know, they say that in Spanish. I can't remember the word, but my mom would, would tell tell people that all the time. You look skinny. Are you in love? Estás en amor? You know, I think that's the word, something like that. You know, are you in love? Because you don't take care of yourself. You're just thinking of that person all the time. Uh, intimacy, a relationship, you know. And then others, too, that, that you have relationships with. You can have friend relationships. I know I have a, a good friend, and when I was with Southern California Edison, I would think about him a lot of, t a lot of times because I love playing basketball. And so I'm like, I wonder what he's doing. I want to go play basketball. Let's see if he's home. And so you call him up on the, on the phone, see if he's home, so you can go play basketball. And so you have this cognitive uh, relationship with an individual. And then emotionally, that emotional love or relationship where you miss the person and you want to be a part of their lives. You know, you want them around and you want to be around. And, and when they're not around, you kind of miss them because they're not around, you know, in a sense. Kind of like a dog, you know. Where's my puppy? Where is it at? You know, and you have this relationship. You just want the dog to be around because you have this emotional relationship with that individual. 
And of course, when you are in love, in love, love with a spouse, you know, or that person that you eventually want to marry, then you are emotionally in strut when they're not around. You're going to do whatever it takes. I'll see you right after work. I'll see you before work. Let's go on the weekends. Let's go on Sunday. Let's, you know, and you take every opportunity to be with them because you can't live without them until you get married. Then you want to live without them. <laughs> Then there's that behavioral where you actually find ways to create a relationship with that person, right? Oh, I can't, <clears throat> I can't make it to work today. <clears throat> I'm feeling a little bit under the weather. And then now you're going out because you want to be with this person for the rest of the day, you know. And so you make up excuses at work. You find alternatives. You find whatever way that you have to. You know, even if they live far away and you live over here, you're going to find a way to go over there, you know, because you're in love. You have a relationship with that individual. Is that the kind of relationship that we're to have with God? That's the question. I think that's a part of it, but I think Peter's idea is a lot deeper than that, because Peter here is saying that believers have a new family relationship with God. It's not a legal relationship. It is cognitive. It is emotional. It is behavioral, but it's deeper than that. It's it's also a parent relationship type. It's an intimacy beyond the natural, not just, as I mentioned, those, but more of divine, divine reverence, which includes something far deeper than just the external that we're to have with God. How do I explain that? It's hard to explain that when you have a relationship with God. Yet you have all these things where you want to be with God. You you make excuses to be with God. And you have this emotional tie to, to not have God leave and, and not be with you. That you miss him when he's gone and so forth. But there's more to it than just that. Where, where he's your everything. You realize that life itself comes from him. You realize that when you pray and you talk with Him, He hears you and that He can literally help you in life situations where, where the external, the natural relationships that we have were very limited. You can't help me in, in certain areas and I can't help you in certain areas. Even though I may have more knowledge than you, I still can't help you. You have to go to a higher source and that has to be God. And that's a divine source and He will be your everything where you know that He loves you because you've, you've experienced it through His Word and you know who He is in His very character. And so then He answers you and then miracles happen, which can't happen between us. Maybe if you're in love and the miracle of marriage and the miracle of children and so forth. But with God, miracles happen. Lives change. Your whole attitude changes. You become a new creature. And that is a relationship is, that is beyond understanding. It's divine. And Peter's trying to get that across to us, that we're not just merely a part of a natural family, but now a divine family. He, John writes in First John 12, and you've all heard this, says, as many as receive or, or welcome Jesus into our hearts, to them he gave the right, that is the authority or the power, the privilege to become children of God. And that's in the, the spiritual sense, not just the natural even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We have a right as children because we've asked God to come into our hearts. We now become children of God. And now he becomes, in a sense, our parent. You know, you'll hear Hollywood oftentimes refer to God. But the reference to God is always God, right? Heaven has a God, and this God is the one that's in control. Where we call on God and we say, Father which is totally different than God. Be more specific, Father. You know, it's, it's speaking of that intimacy and that relationship that you have with a parent. You know, I cherish the moments that I have had with my father, who's now passed. I can remember as a little kid, he wanted to make extra money because we weren't very wealthy. And so he took up um, body work. He went to school and took a couple of classes on Saturdays, and then he learned how to fix dents and things like this. The old style. Back then, you know, where you bang it out, put the bondo and all that stuff. Today, to just replace the whole bumper, you know, and then paint it. And so uh, I would 
wake up in the morning when he had a job and we'd sit in the garage and I'd just help him doing it. I'd mix up that bondo, would smell all those chemicals, you know, you can, I can still smell it in my head, you know, and then him putting it together, drilling the holes to pull it out with the knocker and so forth and banging it. And I remember those times that I had with him. I'll, I'll never be able to get back uh, those times that I missed because he's gone, you know, and that's sad. And I wish I would have spent more time uh, with him, but I can't now. But I do have the memories of the times that we did spend together. And I can remember his characteristics. You know, I can remember the way that he spoke. I can remember the way he acted, even with my children and so forth. And I cherish those moments. But I also cherish the moments that I've had with my Heavenly Father. And there have been a lot of those moments. And I know there will be more moments like that, the time that the Lord just poured his love on me as I was calling out to him and his presence was there. And I felt that presence so strongly that I began to weep and cry because of his presence. I didn't see a figure. I didn't see a face. I don't know what he looks like. I just sense his presence. And it was overwhelming. And I'll never forget it. And I want more of it, you know, if, if he wills. But I will not forget that moment when God came into my heart and my life completely changed. That was the relationship that changed everything. And those are the type of relationships that Peter's talking about. You and I can call on the Lord, just as Stephen called on the Lord when he was being stoned to death, and the Lord saw him, and Stephen saw the Lord stand up to receive him into heaven. That's a personal relationship. I think that he is our father, and we're his children. And in a sense... Because of that, we have this sense of peace and rest in our lives. That it's a personal relationship and not a matter of religious acts. I get scared for some of you. <clears throat> Especially those that are serving. I pray for you. Because you can serve and it becomes a religious act. Well, i got to go to church. Why? Because I have to go do this and I have to go do that and I have to go do this. It's not, oh, I have to go to church. Why? Because I just want to worship God. I just want to praise Him. I just want to keep that relationship with Him. And I understand that because I, fall, I have fallen into that quite often. Because you get so busy with life. And you have to really keep it right here. The, the pur- purpose of serving is not to have a relationship with God. You already have a relationship with God. Serving is just saying, I love you, Lord, and this is why I do these things. And so I'm serving you because I love you. But I love you more than anything else. So you get that picture of Mary and Martha, right? One serving and the other sitting at the feet of Jesus. And we want to make sure that we're sitting at the feet of Jesus all the time. Uh, You can get so religious that you begin to serve here, but you never come here. And that's why we have this, this, this rule if you want to call it a commandment that if you serve here, you need to be in a service once a week. But you get serving so much that you feel I've completed my religious duties that you don't come here. And so you, you don't go to church. You don't go on Wednesday night. You don't sit Sunday morning. And some, some of you do. And I worry about that because where's the relationship? Not only the relation with God, but where's our relationship as a body of Christ, right, with one another, You know, uh, there's a relationship there that God wants to build between us. And it's nice to see that relationship. I I watch Facebook and I see some of you already creating relationships with with other couples, you know, and doing things together. And that's what it's about, along with that relationship with God. So be very careful that it doesn't become a religion Or an act, but it's continually a relationship. So when you call on the Father, you know this, that without partiality, he judges according to each man's work. And Peter is reminding them that God knows what you're going through and how you're suffering. And God, who is not partial, who's just in his judgment, will judge the works that you are doing. Because he's a just God. We need to examine our works and why we're doing them. And make sure that they're done properly. In a sense, as Peter said, you know, girding up your loins, your mind, be sober, be ready, to be diligent to do something for the Lord. Let it not be superficial. You know, if it's superficial, then it's meaningless. 
the work that you are performing. Jeremiah said in 17.10, the Lord searches the heart, tests the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds, according to his ways and his deeds. The Lord wants to bless you, reward you, but it's according to what you're doing. Not what you're doing, but the attitude that you're doing it in. The purpose that you're doing it. The reason that you're doing it. How does God judge us as Christians then? He judges us as at the beam of seat of Christ. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10 is very clear. Believers will not be judged by their sins. Doesn't mean that God wants us to continue to sin. But when we finally leave this place, God isn't going to look at our sins. Our sins are already paid for. Jesus paid for and died for it completely. And so they're done away with. Even if you sin today, God is not going to hold you accountable for your sin. He's not going to bring it up in heaven. Because that's not how he judges you. He's going to judge you alone on what you do for him and in what attitude you're doing it. Romans 24.11 says that when we stand at the judgment seat of God, it says, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us shall give an account of himself to God. What are we going to give an account of? Our works. So look at uh, verse 10 there in Second Corinthians. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All of us as believers will appear before God at the judgment seat of Christ, what they call the Bema seat of Christ, not the white throne judgment. There's a white throne judgment. That judgment is for non-believers who reject Jesus Christ. They will stand there and the only judgment that will come upon them is that their sins will be judged and they will be sent to hell, separated from God for eternity. will not go down that road. We will stand before the Bema seat of Christ himself. Christ who already paid for our sins and washed us and cleansed us from all guilt. We'll stand before him and we will give an account for our works. Notice he says that each one may be recompensed for his deeds, rewarded for his deeds in the body. That is in the flesh right now what we're doing according to what we have done, whether good or bad. Whether good or bad. Now, the word bad does not mean bad in, in, in the sense that that's an evil thing. It means worthless. So there are works that are good and then there are works that are worthless. <clears throat> An example of a work that is worthless. You are doing something for someone because there will be a return for you. For instance, and I'm not saying that, that, that we're guilty of this because you can have the right attitude, but a lot of people give because they get a tax write-off, right? And so they give to the church and they're giving to God, but the whole purpose of it is not to give to God or to the church. It's because I get a tax write-off because I make too much money and I want to keep a lot of that money and so I'm going to give a certain portion of it away so that I can keep this money. That's a worthless giving, because there's no value in the heavens for it. Now there's the attitude of, I'm giving it to God, and praise God that they'll give me some back in my tax return so that I can give even 10% of that. Different attitude. Totally different attitude of giving. So it, it, it's not that it's bad, it's just that it's worthless. Um, I can stand up here, and I can preach the message, and then I can expect you to come up and say, good, good message, Pastor. There's my reward. It's a, it was a worthless work. Because my reward was to hear you say, good message, Pastor. And so when I get to heaven, that, that day, that Sunday, won't be there. Hopefully there will be a few, you know, I hope. You know. And so we have to have the right attitude. We have to have the right understanding of what our works are about. At the Bema Seat of Christ has nothing to do with salvation because we're set already because of the blood of Jesus. But salvation should produce good works. And if there's no fruit in keeping with repentance, it could be that one's repentance is not genuine. For as Jesus said, we, we are to know the tree by its fruit. And so if there are no works, if, if there's no effort, if there is no love uh, for God, then it could be that you are a religious person. And you're basing your relationship 
upon what you do. And you might be here Sunday morning because you want to put your time in. You haven't done it for a while, and so let me go sit in there at least and, and feel better about myself. See, and, and the, the, it's worthless because it's all about you feeling better. And it's not based upon a relationship with God. And God would rather you stay home and, and have a relationship with Him than to go and display a religious act. You, know, you come to church because you want to be in His presence. And we're in His presence right now. And He rejoices in that. He, he, he says He encompasses the praises of His people. He loves it when we're singing and worshiping together. <clears throat> you know, we have an opportunity this coming Thursday to serve the Lord. And it's a challenge for some of us because it's a holiday that we spend time with family. It's a tradition. And, and so I, I won't give up that tradition. I won't give up that time with my family. <clears throat> and I understand that completely. And I'm not saying that it's wrong that you don't. But it's a challenge to say, I'm going to give up myself to be like Christ and say, I've left my Father in heaven. I have nowhere to lay my head, no place to call my own home. And I'm here to reach people for Christ. And I'm going to be Christ-like for once and just let people know that we love them. And just take this one opportunity and serve God. That we may display Him to others. Not that we perform a religious act or get some attaboy or point in heaven, but just to say, God loves you guys. And I know it's hard out there. And some of you are struggling financially and we just want you to know God loves you. I don't know what he has for you. We're not saying we're the answer, but we're saying Jesus is. And if anything, you can have eternal life through him and see from that point on what he has for you in your life and in your family, you know, is up, up, up to him and up in between you and him. Yeah. But we're here to just let you know Jesus loves you. That's an opportunity to serve him and to take that opportunity. And I love the fact that a lot of people are taking that opportunity. We still need some help, but we have enough people to do it. And so I encourage you to pray about it and, and sacrifice a little bit for the Lord too. Notice his next statement then. So, seeing that, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. So, here's an instruction by Peter. Well, one in these statements is that, that while we're on this earth, we ought to conduct ourselves. That word conduct is to turn oneself about, to turn back around, to dwell in a place. In other words, conduct yourself, and we mentioned it last time, don't go back to the way you used to live. Conduct yourself now in a different way. Turn around and serve the Lord. Uh, work for him who judges rightly. But when you do do it in fear, in fear, the word fear there is speaking of reverence, not fear of, of dread or of punishment or anything like that. It, it's phileo, phileo, which meaning it's a parent relationship. You know your parents love you. Now, I understand, generally speaking, Hopefully more than generally speaking, most parents love their children. Once in a while there's a case with drugs and some, some medical chemical imbalance. I understand that. But most parents love their children and children love their parents. It's a relationship. It's not based upon rules. You know, the parents don't have a child. Okay, if you can do this and this, this, you can stay in this household. You know, that's not how it's done. It's, it's, you're in this household. That's not even a question. It's just you need to do these things because it's the proper way to act. And we're training you. And then the child does it. He gets punished, but he still doesn't say, that's it. You keep punishing me. I'm leaving you. Sometimes they do. They run away and they leave, but they come back because, you know, that's my parent. And they understand at a later age when they grow up and realize that my parent loved me enough to correct me. I was just rebellious. And so they come back because you are the parent of that child. And it's a relationship. And so the word fear is speaking of that reverence that you have for one another. Not necessarily you're in fear and dread of the person, but that you have a relationship and you reverence their opinion. You reverence them as, a, as an individual, as a parent, as, as God in this sense here, because he is our judge and we are to fear him. So a wholesome reverence and respect for God. 
is the basis for our godly living. Because we reverence Him, because we love Him, we're going to conduct ourselves correctly. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or knowledge. Uh, fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, Proverbs 8.13. Pride and arrogance and the evil way are for a perverse mouth. And, and so this reverence for God, this love, this intimacy, this relationship that we have with Him is one that is like a parent. And so we reverence Him, not fear of Him, because God would never, never... You know, I don't find it in scriptures where He would totally, you know, hurt us in some negative way. Correct us, but not hurt us, because that's not who He is. He's always looking out for our best interests. Someone said, It matters not what others say, in ridicule or fun, I want to live that I may hear him say to me, well done. That's a relationship. So conduct yourself in reverence of the Lord, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. And again, he repeats himself from earlier. You know, this redemption, this costly redemption that we have is far greater than, than silver or gold. We can't purchase it. We can't buy it. It's not what we do. It's not what we think we have to do. There are a lot of religions out there. I had a friend who, um, who we love very much and we kept witnessing and witnessing to him. He'd gone through several marriages and uh, finally he, he found a, a lady he actually serenaded her. She was she was engaged to get married, and he happened to uh, just fall in love with her, and he went and serenaded her. And she left the guy and fell for him. Talk about love and relationship. And so he, uh, eventually he became a, a believer. But he searched, uh, and he shared with me, he says, you know, I searched everywhere. I, I became a Buddhist, but I, I realized that Buddhist's whole purpose was based upon what you could do to become Nothing, Narvana. You know, it was all your works. Because I, be, I became, um, he looked into Baha'i. He looked into meditation. He talked about meditation, how you had to focus on your navel, your center point, your gravity, you know, your balance in life. He looked at that and again he realized it was everything he had to do to try to balance it. Then he looked at the yin and the yang. The evil and how they coexist and so forth. And he realized that it was all about him. You know, and what he could do, and he realized that no matter what faith he looked into, no matter what religion it was, even some of the Christian cults like Jehovah Witness, realizing that it was their works, that they had to do so many works, and that even that wouldn't even get them into heaven, because only 144 were there, so they were going to have to dwell on earth. You know, and so forth. And even the Mormon is, Mormons who said you have to do works, and you have to keep their sacraments, and take their vows, and so forth. So all of them... And then he realized when he saw our relationship with the Lord and heard us plenty of times that, that Christianity and in Christianity, you don't have to do a thing. Jesus did it all. All you have to do is just believe in his work and he'll save you. He'll save you. So it's not any precious silver or gold or anything like this. It's just the work of Jesus Christ. And because you accept that and you love him, you want to live for him and so you're willing to stop living an aimless life aimless and that's what it is it's aimless if you're living without christ it's aimless you're not going anywhere yeah you're living life to the best that you can but it's not leading to anywhere but to death and the bible tells us that for the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life how's your life doing are you living aimlessly how are you doing with the Lord? Do you have purpose? Do you have some goals? Because the Lord has goals and purposes for you in this life. He goes on and says, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so again, it comes to the blood of Christ, our Redeemer. Notice the word precious. Peter uses this word six times in reference to the Lord's blood, to the Lord's redemption, to the Lord's call. 
It's precious in his sight. Peter understood that. We should understand our salvation and how precious it is that God redeemed us. And notice the emphasis is on the blood of Christ. It's on the blood of Christ. Not on Christ, but the blood of Christ. It was shed for us. And so he says and takes that Old Testament saying uh, or, or picture of the lamb without blemish or without spot. In other words, it's flawless. It's an Old Testament picture. Before AD 70, the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, would literally take a lamb, they would inspect it, and then they would slaughter it, and then their sins would be forgiven. God would accept that as an offering for the forgiveness of their sins. But when the temple was finally destroyed and hasn't been rebuilt, there has not been one animal slaughtered by the Orthodox Jew. Why? Because in God's eyes, he said, that's it, I'm not going to allow you to anymore because my son's already been slaughtered. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. His blood was already shed once and for all. And so there's no more any need for a sacrifice. And so he stopped it by one reason is destroying the temple for its destruction. That may change once we get to the tribulation period when they offer up their vain sacrifices again. But God will will reveal himself. And so he was a lamb, a prefigure of Christ, Jesus and his precious blood. For indeed, for he indeed was pre or foreordained before the foundations of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you. So the crucifixion of Jesus was planned by God. It was God's whole plan. Before the world even existed, God already knew. It says a lot about God's foreknowledge. It says a lot about how he's in control. And he already knows us. That always blows me away. I don't fully understand it, yet I receive it. You know, that God knows me. Because there are times where, in my prayers, I'm saying, Lord, take me home because I'm useless. There's no need for me to be here. There are plenty that you could use. I, I can't do what you're calling me to do. So just take me home. Then he reminds me, but you're already forgiven. No matter what you do, you've already accepted. And I have a plan for you. And I always miss that plan ahead of time because I'm only in the moment. And I'm looking at myself, which is pride. Because I'm looking at myself and how I can't do it. And how I don't have the ability. And how I keep messing up. You know? And yet he says, I know all that because I preordained you before the foundations of the world. And that blows me away because I'm just... Because it's like, well, then how come I don't stop? If I know this, how come I don't stop? You know, it's hard. But this is true. So even if you sin today and even right now, even in our minds, yet God has already preordained for you to continue on and doing what you're doing, you know, which blows me away. I don't think I'll ever understand it completely. But it keeps you going forward, right? Because of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So he goes on and says in verse 21, Who through him believes in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Your faith. Let me read the Amplified Bible. It kind of makes it a little clearer. Through him you believed in, or you relied upon God, who raised him up from the dead and gave him honor and glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So the whole purpose of it all, the whole redemption plan before the foundations of the world and all the works and the things we go through is all for our good, for the, for the growth of our faith and for the hope that we have in God, that he is in control. Let me close and then we'll partake of communion. Let me restate that phrase in the beginning again. Religion preserves our pride. Whereas relationship requires us to cast it aside. Let me summarize. Peter says, as children of our Heavenly Father, who judges our works based upon our relationship with Him, which comes through His Son's blood, we have faith and hope in God. Let's pray.